Jamaica grew on us. We found a whole Guyanese community here. Jamaica is a wonderful place for all its problems. We love it dearly. I've been in love with production and filmmaking for the better part of almost 25 years. Now. I have shot and directed two of my own short films. I have been one of the first directors on the Jamaica Film and Television Association. We have to invest money in building industry, actually producing high level content that will get the high level talent employed and working on a consistent basis in this country. Hello Throppers and welcome back to another video podcast episode and if this is your first time visiting a special welcome to you. My name is Winthrop Wellington and I am the host of On Deck with Throp where we have meaningful conversations with people from all over the world all about Jamaica. Today we have a really awesome and special guest, a unique one if I may say so myself. We have a Guyanese Jamaican filmmaker and that of Mr. Kyle Idol, Idol, excuse me, Kyle. <laughs> I always called you Superman because <laughs> you could be Kyle, L, right? Yeah. And so I just want to take this opportunity to welcome you to the podcast, and uh, again, appreciate you taking the time out to be here. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, very much looking forward to our conversation today. And with that, I just want to give you an opportunity to actually introduce yourself to the audience. Hey, um, so I've, you know, I'm born in Ghana in South America and grew up here for about, um, lived here for about 30 years of my life. And, you know, I've been in love with production and filmmaking for the better part of almost 25 years now. You know, it's shocking, you know, when people find out how old I am and stuff, they're always shocked to see. But I've been um, involved in filmmaking now uh, for just over 10 years, um, I started, you know, I kind of started helping out friends and stuff. And then it just snowballed into me, you know, getting my degree. And, you know, now I'm, you know, it, it's my life. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And I'm, one of the reasons I'm super excited for this conversation is that I don't very in seldom do I have the opportunity to sit down and talk shop with somebody yeah. about filmmaking, uh, which we will get into very <laughs> yeah, deeply. Yeah. And I hope we're able to keep <laughs> the audience with us along our, our little conversational journey here. Um, but to start with, what uh, was the reason for your parents moving from Guyana to Jamaica? Uh, it was about the time, um, I was actually a newspaper article today that says Guyana has one of the highest immigration rates in the world, like over half our population lives abroad. Wow. And so we are kind of victims of, you know, not a great economy at the time and stuff. So, um, yeah, we had moved to initially to Canada and dad had a, just thrown out applications, applied to the job, a job here at the University of the West Indies. And um, yeah, he came down for an interview. And next thing we know, he's we have we're on a plane coming down to live in Jamaica. Oh, wow. <laughs> and what how long are we talking? Ago? How long? This is about almost 30 years, 30 years last year. Okay. So we're headed to 31 next month. I was going to say, and you guys, your parents, your family have not left. Have not left. Jamaica grew on us. Um, we found a whole Guyanese community here. Um, you know, um, my dad, you know, my dad is a very social person. He, we, you know, we built a kind of a, a family out here, really. And, you know, Jamaica is a wonderful place for all its problems. We love it dearly. No, that's awesome. And that's great to hear. You're the first person that we have had on the podcast that was, uh, I would say, inter-Caribbean, I would say. And so I'm... <laughs> yeah. um, Again, very much for, looking forward to your perspective on so many things. And you basically grew up here and you're basically Jamaican. <laughs> and <laughs> um, with that, I know we were talking before, you have worked and have had opportunities all over the world, but this is, this is your home in a sense. Yeah, it, it was even when I left school, I, you know, my intention was always to get experience where I could and then bring that experience home, mm -hmm. you know? So I took my opportunities and had an opportunity to come back home and, you know, take on a pretty big challenge at the time. And yeah, I've been here. I, you know, I've since then I've been working to help build the industry out here. I'm trying to participate where I can while trying to simultaneously build my own career in film and TV and stuff like that. And speaking of your career, you've kind of had a, a pretty interesting journey into how you got here and that you 
originally were studying computer science. And so let's go back to that and why you decided to study computer science. Yeah. So I've always kind of been the tech guy, um, you know, the tech support in the family, that kind of thing. Um, I grew up, I was lucky enough to have grown up around computers and that kind of thing from the reader rabbit on, I think the Mac two. And we had, um, when we moved here, a friend lent us their old, like 1970 something compact as well. So I'm, you know, I came from the days of command line and all of that kind of stuff and having to boot from floppy five and a half floppies. And that kind of led me into, um, playing around with visual effects and stuff. Um, I built my first computer with graphics card and stuff when I was about 12 or so. And then, you know, I started to play around. I, you know, I, I learned how to acquire software, <laughs> acquire. <laughs> acquire software from the internet. So I got my hands on um, Photoshop and um, After Effects and stuff like that. And, you know, back in those days, I really hadn't put a lot, you know, mentally put a lot together, like performance and stuff. So, you know, it was rendering out these 12 frames per second videos and stuff. And I did like um, at one point, my first my first real um, kind of digital visual effects video was a stupid thing where I learned how to do a lightsaber thing. So I took like a screwdriver handle and it's just me just like playing around with it and knocking it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it switches on and like blows a hole through it, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and I shot that we had a old like old digital camera. They, if I were to like print the image now, it'd probably be the size of my thumbnail <laughs> and stuff. And I, I would shoot stupid videos. And also I remembered, um, it had slipped my mind for a long time, but back in high school, we were asked to do a little project on, um, no smoking, don't smoke kind of thing. And I actually did, um, we had a old video camera as well. And I hooked that up to the VCR and did tape to tape editing of this commercial I shot with my friends in my yard and stuff. I wish I could go back to the school and find if they have the tape somewhere by by some miracle or if I have it somewhere in the house. But yeah, that's kind of, and, and at the same time I was doing all of that, I would, I, you know, kind of followed my sister to an audition one day um, for theater. And we, we, you know, I got into the show and, you know, singing, dancing, musicals, that kind of stuff. I love musicals to this day. Um, I'm actually working on one right now. And I, you know, ended up on stage that year, but the next year it got the popularity of the, the thing blew up and, um, the company blew up and I didn't get into the next show. There was just so much talent that was were better singers, better dancers, better actors than me. And I was disappointed, but you know, everybody's like, Hey, you know, you can just come and work backstage. Cause all my friends were the, you know, older, um, you know, older teenage boys. And, you know, I was, I, I just wanted to hang out with my friends. So they're like, yeah, man, come on, you know, come work backstage with us. And I ended up, um, kind of assisting one of my friends who was doing audio on the show. And he, um, he, um, was kind of half migrating. He was traveling a lot at the time. And then the original backup guy just did not show up one night for the show. And so they're like, Kyle, you know, all the cues for the show. You've seen the show a dozen times by now. Can you do it? And I was like immediately into the deep end. And I, you know, that kind of kicked off my career in production. I started doing sound for dance shows, company dance theater, and a lot of small shows. Then that led into me working part time at the theater as well. And this is me at 13, wow. <laughs> you know? Um, to this day, I still have nightmares about my, that very first show. It was an adaptation of Lion King and, um, I still have visions of my hand just going through the, the soundboard and not being able to stop a cue <laughs> and that kind of stuff. And, you know, that eventually led me into, um, production design. Um, I actually picked up a, a nomination, an actor boy nomination for Cats, um, probably close to um, 10 years later. Wow. And then um, I moved into learning lighting as well at the theater. And I um, eventually almost ended up working full time at the theater while I was a student at UE doing computer science. And my, I was at an inflection point because I was kind of dragging out my degree as you do, you know, when you find other priorities mm -hmm. <laughs> at school. And eventually my whole family was like, Kyle, you really have, don't have your passion for, um, you know, for, for computer science you once did, you know? 
And it was it was really just timing because I was kind of in that gap before before apps blew up and before things. So the kind of support structure and community wasn't really there. It was a lot of corporate work that was um, you know, that was that was the opportunities at the time. And I'm uh I find myself being more of a person that wants to take chances and build cool things. That's kind of my inner mantra. I always want to be doing something cool and trying to do something that kind of sparks my interest. Um, and film and TV and stage and stuff lets me do that. <laughs> and so I, you know, it was a point of introspection at that point. And I decided, you know, if I'm going to do this, let me look at all of my opportunities in um in the creative space because um if i do theater i knew kind of what the industry was like i knew the ladder i'd have to climb there and it was it, at that time it was also we also had a, a little bit more limitations on the opportunities we had out here we weren't doing the big shows we didn't quite have the demand that we that we are starting to have now um and i also had a couple of bad experiences working for some other people and so I decided, hey, let me try film. Mm -hmm. um, I had been helping out um, a couple of my friends, um, Juan Ryan, who he was the camera guy. He was photographer, um, head of the um, um, photography society at UE. So he got, he had a digital camera, I was one of the first people. So I learned some of the basics of photography from him. And then I had another friend, Sharom at Caramac. And she would come to me to help her with all her projects and stuff. And we ended up shooting for her, one of her projects, a really cool shot that I actually found a clip of uh, in deep in my YouTube page <laughs> the other day, um, one, an outtake. And, you know, that, you know, kind of, I realized I did no narrative structure from working. When you, when you work in theater and you're working in the theater, you see, especially in my position where I'm a front of house mixer, you see dozens um <laughs> dozens of shows every year you know what's the front of house mixer um so you have in stage shows you have different levels of audio so you have people mixing monitors and then you have people mixing for the audience that's there okay. so i was mixing primary even though my work at it's a small theater so i was doing both um that's the best way to describe what i was doing because my primary job was to mix for the host for the audience this is sound this is so okay yeah, and then I, at the time, was also doing lighting and stuff like that. Um, I remember our old lighting board. Half the board would never work, and, and it was like almost everything was manual. We couldn't program anything. So I came up at a very interesting time because it was a transition for a lot of these things. So by the time I actually came back from film school into the theater, they had moved on to these you know little lighting board that you know could do 10 times the things the old the old gigantic lighting board could do and stuff like that and yeah and so i in the transition going back to my thing i got i had a friend who was working in um a tv at the time and i told her that um what i you know was interested in trying you know checking it out and seeing if i was really interested and she got me on to set one day. And, you know, I'm, to this day, I'm so grateful to everybody who kind of was there at that inception point. You know, I spent the day, um, I think it was two days actually, crouched on that camera with just tape. And anytime anybody wanted a mark on the ground, I was like the guy who's like, come in and tape down things. You know, I was so afraid of just messing up or anything. And, you know, that led me to work on a couple more commercials and stuff like that. And um, I realized that it was a space that I could build on what I'd learned kind of informally in theater and, you know, decided that, OK, film was a good place to kind of expand. There's demand for film. I can travel a little bit more and and do it. And um, and that led me to actually trying to get into school to actually get credentialed in the space and to also um one thing that one reason i actually went abroad to school is because um i wanted a, a chance to get my hands on things that i couldn't get in jamaica at the time you know we had very limited cameras you know um, because we just didn't have the demand for them locally um, you know, more lighting equipment to, you know, just get that chance and to get the chance to play around with these things. Um, so I applied to school in Canada, didn't get in. 
some reason Canada doesn't like me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I did get into um, full sail. You know, I did get into school in. I got into school in Canada actually, um, but I ended up going to school in Florida, and I went to Full Sail University, um, which you know is a more technical school. Um, they started as recording arts school and moved into moved into film. So they're you know um, a great place if you're a very technically minded person like me because I saw the technical space as my space at the time. You know I really had no aspirations necessarily for being you know writer director kind of thing. Um, but while I was there, I had the opportunity to also work with an amazing um, year, um, kind of year group, graduating group. And, you know, we, we're all still, a lot of us still talk. And, you know, we, you know, we really pushed each other while we were at school. And that kind of pushed me to embrace a lot more of the art side of, um, of filmmaking. And um, I specialized in cinematography. I still consider myself primarily a cinematographer as I continue to grow in the other, the writing and directing space. Um, and it's still, it's still my love. I'm still a camera guy. I will still go and, you know, when Ari drops their new camera, <laughs> Sony drops their new camera, Canon, you know, still go and drool over a spec sheet mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and then I spent time working in the States. Um, I got to work on a couple of very low budget things and no budget stuff. And, you know, when, and, you know, it worked out, you know, um, one of my things is I was young at the time and I'm like, you know what, let me spend my energy. Let me get the experience. I have time to invest in these things. And I did, and it was fun. It was fun. And then I had the opportunity to work with my friend, David Mullings, um, on, um, his, he wanted to do a media company and we, we formed Real Vibe Studios um, based off of his Real Vibes brand, um, which started out actually in um, kind of in the pre-YouTube era mm -hmm. of, play, of having online streaming music videos. And he could talk for days about that <laughs> adventure. And um, yeah, so um, for about, and I worked with him, we collaborated on various projects and stuff for um, for a good, a good while after school and eventually, and during this, I started to grow in a little bit more into the space as a writer, um, which stemmed back from my days in theater of having to read, um, all kinds of scripts written. I've had, you know, scripts that were given to us on folder paper, photocopied folder paper, <laughs> and, you know, all kinds of formats and typed in word and, all kind of word art in, in the script and stuff. And I really, I learned how to format scripts out of that, you know, both theater and screen, because I was just looking for some way for me to organize what I needed to do technically. And eventually that led me into kind of starting to learn, oh, this is how the storytelling side of things works. And that led me into just, I just, while I was at school, I was writing. Um, I've always written um, stuff, poetry and stuff like that. And I've always, um, since I started kind of down the path of film, I've just kept writing, writing whatever, whatever ideas would come to me. I have a folder on my, on my cloud drive thing with any idea that comes to me, I will put it down. I will start whatever comes to my head there. And I know at some point I'm going to come back and it will become a script, a short or a series pilot or something or it will end up in a script in some way and i just kept at it and um i wrote my i wrote um a couple of spec features i've written a lot of short films um i've i've actually shot and directed two of my own short films and i am currently working on a feature a horror feature and kind of that's where you find me today i've i've directed a lot of um like PSA work and commercial work and um done a lot of um shooting on documentaries and stuff like that. So it's really been an exciting kind of space. <laughs> That's kind of where my journey is right now. No, it seems like you really came up through the ranks in uh, more or less starting from the bottom. 
and working your way up being a gaffer doing lighting audio uh, then going and switching from a computer science degree and then going to film school starting your own production company with a partner and now you're making your your own films how valuable was it for you to work under somebody in the states and i said you said you had no budget and low budget that you that you yeah. work and did um i'm not i don't even have to go as far as the states um a lot of my most um most the best experiences i've had learning is working um under some of our local people um uh god rest this old chappy san just is one of my mentors um, Rohan Garrix, Nadine Roxborough, John DaCosta, when I was in theater, I learned a lot about the basic, the very basics of production and lighting and stuff under them. And, you know, um, they are some of the best talents we've had. And, you know, then when I went to the States, I found myself, I tend to find myself mentors who tend to be older from the old school of stuff because I'm a believer in understanding even though we have all this new technology and stuff i think it's important to understand the where we're coming from because if you understand the why then you can maximize the advantages that the new technology brings and the, the context I'm, I'm kind of bringing this in is there are maybe young person who is watching this, maybe a young person who's interested in film and maybe a young person, and it doesn't even matter whether you're young or old, or whatever, but somebody who's interested in, in film and they hear this story and you're starting at 13 and you've been doing it for multiple decades to get to yeah. where you are, uh, you know, what sort of advice would you give somebody who's re even remotely interested in doing something yeah, like you're doing? I, uh, thinking about it, I think the, the best advice I could give is to be is to be available to do anything and to be willing and able to do the grunt work to um you know you're not gonna go straight to the top we had uh we had an era when these digital cameras these small dslrs and stuff and very cheaply available with high quality stuff came out and everybody um just wanted to become photographer director of photography um director and nobody was really willing to do the grunt work hey how do you light you know if you're not if you haven't lifted uh you know if you haven't rigged a light a three-point light setup you know why are you now coming to tell me that you're a dp <laughs> <laughs> you know um because there's so much more um to the job than just being able to point a camera and getting a pretty picture out of it you know um it's one thing they told me at school um but at school, one of the things I learned is how strict um, the international industry is about your department. And, you know, I am, a, you know, coming from Jamaica where we're hustlers, we want, you know, we're, we have to kind of, you have to kind of do everything here um, to, to get things done. And, you know, me as the, you know, coming in, I want to go and lift lights and I want to go and, you know, rig, you know, rig, help them rig camera and stuff. And the, the instructors looked on me and said, no, dude, you are not allowed to touch that camera. Mm. <laughs> you know, you do not. You are the director of photography. And what you need to be learning right now is how to manage and communicate with your team. You know, and if you know, you know, if you're coming up through the ranks and you have that discipline where You've learned how to take instruction from people and you, you learn, you know, you learn the basics um, so that you know that when you get to that stage of being a DP, being a director, then you know how to talk to the talk to the rest of your team. Um, and, you know, I find that's a little bit lost and because it's just, it was just so easy to get to that place where people are calling you because you're the guy with the camera and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And even for me, like learning um, that skill to manage and communicate is still something I'm still growing with to this day, you know, because the urge is the urge to just, I want to do this myself. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, right. and I want to learn this is great. And, but, you know, little by little, you start to break down and understand, you know, and where you, where you can. And um, that's the other thing. That's the other piece of advice I would give people is learn how to trust. 
because if you don't have trust in your team then you um it's good the whole thing is going to fall apart because then you're going to start to panic and you're not going to have belief that you know nobody's going to be there and you're going to end up doing the wrong thing mm -hmm. yeah. no i feel like you're you're, you're talking to me <laughs> when, you, when you say that um but going back to just the and, I, and this goes without saying it took a lot of hard work and probably countless hours of your dedication and your commitment and you said the word before which was disciplined um to, to get to where you are and i i don't have a tremendous amount of experience in uh, this traditional media format but you know i have my media company which is mostly focused on youtube and then we do a bit of client work as well and um I have found that exactly what you're saying that like they're, you know, people I work with, they just want to jump that gun, you know, and because they have a camera because they have this and, but they're, but I, what if the thing about where I am, you know, I didn't go to film school and I went to YouTube university more than anything else. But the thing is that like, I have an immense amount of respect for this art form. And I understand that patience is so much a big part of this game because there's so much to learn and there's so many different aspects of filmmaking cinematography you talk about sound lighting oh my gosh it's like overwhelming and if you start and approach this thing like oh i want to just be the top guy the director or whatever it is it's just like you're building a house of cards and i and i realized that very quickly you're building a house of cards and you just need to learn like one skill set by skill set and literally like you want to master them, you know, as best as you possibly can. And we all have this limited resource called time, but nonetheless, it's like so important to master these individual skills so that eventually, like you said, even being a DP, like communication is like so important in this industry. And um, I'm just really happy that you, you touched on this and obviously you're living through it. Oh man, don't discount YouTube University. You know, that, <laughs> that's where I started. You know, um, Film Rat on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, he is, he has been such a gift to just educating people in the film space. He's one of the reasons why I even looked at Full Sail University. Yeah, Brian Connolly and his team. I think they're in Texas now. But um, yeah, don't discount like don't discount YouTube University at all. But yeah, um, and it's not even just about learning them the skills um, for myself, like me learning everything, but just to have a base knowledge and appreciation of things because there is stuff that I can't touch skill wise. I don't, I'm not a music person at all. I know the basics. I can play piano. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a background in sound, but to hear um, one of my collaborators, I work with um, a guy named Soretzi Small. And he to hear him talk about music and break down things in the context of music still amazes me today to this day. And I, you know, I've recently started to make an effort to learn um, some at least some aspects of it from my perspective as a writer and, a, you know, editor and a director um, to understand how music works, okay. you know, so that I can talk to him you know, on a level where I can maximize in my vision when we do collaborate, I can maximize his skill set and his contribution to the final work. Because, you know, sound and music and and those things work, they, they're, you know, probably as, or even more so in some contexts, uh, you know, important as the visuals these days. You know, especially, like I said, my latest piece was a horror piece. And sound design was such a huge thing for me because you know horror it's very it's, it's very dark you know you're shooting yeah. in a lot of darkness and so you're reliant on that sound design element those music elements to really heighten and enhance the mood and and that kind of thing and i think as a director you know we talk about auteurs you know these the alfred hitchcocks and chris nolans and stuff like that and they they tend to be spoken about in a thing like they are the ultimate masters of their of the medium and you know they know everything to do with the movie but the truth is when you actually analyze their work and it's something that i actually did while i was at school i i'm a huge like history of film kind of buff um, i love older films i love to understand because they 
are coming from a place where they didn't have the technology where they were making a lot of things up as they went along so there's a lot to learn from them but when you start to break down the work of a lot of these masters it's not that they could do everything themselves or they knew every single beat of it it's that they knew where they needed help and they knew how to communicate their vision to their collaborators that you know and in that way you end up with you know the cinematography of rope or the you know the sound design of interstellar you know or the the, the framing of like a dark night you know those kinds of things and i think that you know if to be a successful director is being able to wield those tools um in a way that you know it that film is film is collaborative it is and you need to you need to be able to talk to people and you know it's not just you at the end of the day mm-hmm. i'm getting goosebumps with you talking about <laughs> this uh and these different directors and them putting these pieces together and yeah for sure like the what like how you're talking about it is like these guys have to be amazing quarterbacks and people really underestimate that c word the communication and that's that's everything and being able to put these teams together that they trust you as a leader and then like you said before like you have to trust these people as well and with that i want to kind of get into like your your filmmaking and what you're doing currently and you mentioned horror films can now can you tell us about your Uh, uh, situation uh, with that yeah yeah um so my last project was a film called nice lady um i've been since i graduated school actually um i actually had a at one point i actually had a distribution deal with a, a a company out of la um for you know um, about five films um but we hadn't been able to follow up on that because money mm-hmm. <laughs> money is the hardest thing we can talk about money later yeah. but um one of the things they kind of told us when we were having the initial discussions is where you guys want to be as a small company coming up is you want something that you can do on a budget that is has the widest global impact and when you look when you do your industry analysis you look at the numbers worldwide horror is that genre and i i it is also kind of my guilty pleasure okay <laughs> i watched nightmare on elm street way too young same 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 <laughs> um silence of the lambs as same. well <laughs> um and spent a lot of sleepless nights <laughs> so i um Yeah, I was looking for a long time for, I'd written a spec script um, called um, Based on 25 Ways to Kill a Werewolf. And that was a little bit more lean, more Teen Wolf space. You know, it was more action horror than horror horror. But I learned a lot of the elements. Um, But I wanted a, um, with this first project, I wanted something that could be just a short film. I had no aspirations fit to be more than the short film at the time. So I wrote the initial, I I was kind of piecing together what this would look like. I wanted to think. And then a friend of mine, she went on Twitter and she outlined this experience that she had with a man. She'd go home to her apartment and this guy would just be there. And he would come up to her window. She lived in a ground floor apartment. And he would come up to her window and talk to her through this window and just harass her day in, day out. And we and she related this story. And I at the time with horror, I realized that the core of good horror is to find what scares you as a writer, what scares you as the creator of this. And her Personally, I have very few things that I have phobias about. Um, But to hear one of my friends speak about how helpless she was, that, and it was something that nobody, she went to the police, they couldn't do anything, you know, and, you know, me as her friend, I couldn't do anything. You know, there, there is no, I could see no way out. And that shook me to my core that, you know, there are situations that are, you know, beyond me that I can't do anything about to people that are close to me. And I reached out to her and I said, you know, 
you, you know, talk to her about my idea and stuff. And she's like, yeah, go ahead. And she one day she came to me and she's like, here are all my notes. <laughs> you know, I kept detailed diaries of this. Um, and she gave the project my blessing. She still hasn't seen it yet. But I started to construct this. Um, I, start, I had it started before, but I started to construct the story. It took me about a year to really get it to where I wanted it. Um, one thing that was important to me in writing Nice Lady was that I had um, the eyes of uh, women on it. So I had um, friends read it. I had uh, um, another great screenwriter, uh, Ms. Ann Morrison, um, do a official, like I paid her money to review and give me notes on this. And it evolved. Um, it was originally just set in the apartment, but it evolved into this whole journey of this um young woman coming home from work one night late one night and this the, the um the spirit takes set on her and the spirit itself is um kanaima which comes from the amerindian um folklore it's a it's a it's a shape-shifting demon spirit um so i adapted it so that rather than just being a general evil spirit it represented the kind of possessive nature, the worst of men, you know, so it would, its powers were that it could jump and possess um, from man to man and possess and possess the men on her journey home and just follow her and harass her for this journey because it wanted to claim her soul. Mm. And so I built this the story out and eventually you know, and we, it took me, um, this was what, 2019. And I was trying to, I had to get the script into a place that I liked it first. Um, because my previous work, I was still uncomfortable with how that final execution on that. So I felt like if I went in with a stronger script, it would be better. And so the, um, you know, um, as I was developing it, it was just originally the Kanaima had no voice. It didn't, it was just there as a presence and a point of view. But then in my rewrites, I decided to give it a voice and make it a character, make it a very active antagonist so that, you know, we could um, see this evil and the thought process behind this evil. Um, and then um, I ran into COVID. Mm. <laughs> We were supposed, we were scheduled to shoot in May 20, 2020 and the money finally got there. You know, that's always the struggle money. The money finally got there and then perhaps COVID happened, couldn't shoot. That was the, that was when all the lockdowns happened. And I was a year basically of sitting down became two years basically. Yeah. And then January, you know, and then I reached, I had struggles, my, you know, the original person I wanted to produce, she had hurt her back and it was all sorts of things that were just kicking this down the road, but I got to work on the script some more and, you know, eventually finally got going, reached, um, February, um, 2022 now. And I'm like, all right, we're going to have an opportunity to screen it. Let me get this done. We shot, um, shot the first couple of things in April I went and started editing, realized I needed some more. I needed to work on some more things, um, kind of did a couple of rewrites and then did some final shooting in um, early June, end of May. And, um, and in all of this, COVID was also a role because I had traveled, so I couldn't shoot like right away um i had to wait on myself to clear right. and then also amazingly the when we were doing the original shooting i had cast wonderful did all my casting had some had a great actress in the lead role get a phone call seven o'clock the night before we were start, supposed to start to shoot kyle i have covid oh man <laughs> I was lying down. I just laid down on the floor of, of the house and I was like, all right, what am I going to do? And this is one of the benefits of understanding the production process and, you know, always having a plan. And I just went through in my head, who could I call? Who could I call? Finally popped into my head. Um, I had a student, um, a former student, Pepita Little. 
and like hey i remember she had acted in a couple of short films and stuff i reached out to her and said hey pepita do you have a reel or something i could see some of your work <clears throat> send me her work and i'm like reached called my cousin who is she's also involved in film um Director, my director, writer, Maya Wilkinson, very talented. Um, I reached out to her and said, "Hey, ma'am, um, take a look at this. Have you seen Pepita acting other things?" And she's like, "Yeah, she'd be good for the role. I think she can do it." Pepita came on board, learned that role overnight, went out, shot the next night, and fantastic. From the first screening, people were just were just awesome. wow. This awesome. is Pepita, you know, that kind of stuff, and. Yeah, and we it came out, it was part of GATFest. It was actually funded by the um, UWI Community Film Project. What's GATFest? So GATFest is the Greater Augustown Film Festival. Well, formerly known as the Greater Augustown Film Festival, but it is um, one of the larger short film festivals in Jamaica. Okay. So it's been an annual event since about 2015. Oh, no, before 2015, I think 2013. Um, yes, this was their 22, 2023 was their 20, 10 year anniversary, right? So um, our last year was their 10, 10th anniversary. Um, so they they funded about uh, three short films and two got made, mine and another one, um, A Touch of Sugar, another fantastic um, piece from Vanessa Henshaw that I had the privilege of helping to um, helping to con do some early consultation on that script. Um, so I was very very happy to see the outcome of that. Um, yeah, and we screened at Gatfest, and we screened at a couple of other kind of Caribbean-oriented film festivals as well. I missed the Trinidad um, Film Festival last year, but we are hopefully going to get in this year. Um, and eventually, you know, it'll go online and stuff. And what does what does screening mean? What does that entail? Okay, so screening is um, at the film festivals. You you know you apply to the film festivals, and they will actually. Um, program and assign your um, your film on a specific night. So when you know with these projects early out, it's the hope is to screen at a film festival and get a little bit of buzz, maybe win an award or two, mm -hmm. and get you know moving in the in the project, moving to another level or get attention as a creator or a studio or whatever. And when you say get attention or moving. Is this more so focused on distribution or maybe? Yeah, so okay. it, in in larger projects, it tends to be about distribution. So if you're doing a feature film, for instance, you will go to a film festival looking for a distribution deal. You're usually using it as a, it's a marketing tool, mm -hmm. um, more or less these days. Um, but you do have people that make films for the festival circuit, just for the audiences at these festivals as well. So, but by and large, a lot of us are really just looking to get attention so that we can say, oh, you can, this is, this is our proof of concept. You know, we're trying to sell this idea like, hey, I can do horror, I can do drama, I can do comedy. And so with me, my strategy has been um, focused mainly around genre, genre um, festivals as well as um, regional style festivals. So. Um, we played in Grenada. We played in LA. Um, awesome. And then, where? What are you looking to achieve with that? So, with um, Nice Lady, it's one of three projects that I'm calling the House of Baku. Baku is another um, is another Amerindian spirit. Um, okay. I love to. I, my, one of my goals is actually to try and um, integrate a lot of those aspects of my own culture and background because I'm a I'm a mix up child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have, you know, I have every kind of ethnicity in my blood. So I, I love to use my work as a chance to explore the cultural aspects of that background. And so um, I've used the Kanaimen one. Um, and I, the House of Baku is a concept that I've had to kind of create a Caribbean horror brand, um, horror thriller brand that's focused on horror stories that integrate both our culture, like the, the spirits and stuff like that, alongside our cultural issues. So each of my films is a horror film, but it's focused about um, on a specific cultural issue that we face in the Caribbean, you know, kind of literally facing our demons, if you will. Mm. So with Nice Lady, it's about gender-based violence and harassment. 
Um, my next film that I am working on as a full feature from the start is called Blackout, and that's focused on... Um, it's done from the perspective of a man, and it's really discussing kind of our inability as men to take responsibility for what we do in society and that one that one is really exciting it's based on some movies it's inspired i should say not really based on but inspired by some um both horror and kind of actiony drama movies um that i i love dearly um what's it um high tension hot tension which is a french horror movie which is it's very gory but it's mm -hmm. it's really it's a really interesting concept and um Another one, Falling Down, which is a movie from the 90s, I think 91 or 92 from, um, who directed that? Was it Bruckheimer? I think it's Jerry Bruckheimer okay. directed it um, with Michael Douglas, where he's just this guy and he's like going home on a day, he's just pissed off and gets out in traffic and just goes on a rampage through LA. So I've kind of merged elements of those into this script and I'm really kind of looking forward to it because I've written it as another kind of contained horror movie. Um, so um, with them, we are trying to do um, three of them. We are, and the last one, we're still working on it, but that one is set in, in Guyana, actually. Uh, so, and I've written the first two I wrote myself, but the third one I've actually brought on a collaborator and we'll probably have somebody else direct that while I move into more of a producing role. Gotcha. <clears throat> because one of my goals as well um, with all my work is every time I work, I want to introduce somebody new to a uh, position, whether it's producer or DP or whatever. Um, because while I, you know, I'm growing as an artist, we do, I, you know, I see the need to make the space for other artists and, um, you know, young people to kind of come up in that space. And what's the difference from a technical standpoint between a short and a full feature film? Okay, so with the the dis differences are largely kind of structural um how you pace out the story um with a short you tend to have a lot more narrative freedom you can try things a short can be totally abstract and work um whereas you need to have with a feature you need to have some amount of structure and focus to what you do um the beat you know kind of you have to hit certain certain flow points in your story and stuff you do have room to be abstract but you need to have um you know there there are structural i don't want to say rules but there are structural guides to how thing to how to what happens in it um <clears throat> uh, when i teach um screenwriting and stuff i try to say guys i'm showing you this i'm gonna call them rules sometimes but it's not really rules. These are just the basics that you're gonna look at any script and you will see these structural points. And then you are going to eventually internalize these things and then adapt them to your own style and your own voice. You know, so, so you know, we talk about act structure and saving the cat and high climax and all that thing. All those are in every script, but in, you know, in a feature versus in a TV show versus a TV movie and stuff like that, they all occur in different points. And then depending on the, um, you know, the voice of the, uh, the writer and director and stuff, those all have impacts in the, um, in the final, what it looks like on the screen. I see. I see. And you're speaking earlier about um, special effects. And so I kind of want to know, uh, get an understanding of like what that's like in, in your world. Uh, not only with like, say, an After Effects program or maybe use something different, um, but also even like you're in horror too, right? So I'm assuming there's blood splattering, there are wounds, uh, that sort of thing. If you can kind of like break that down a little bit, because I would say most of my audience like are not in, are not in this. Yeah. And also me, I don't even have any yeah. experience so in it as well. So VFX are... Um, uh, it, they're part and parcel with filmmaking, okay. especially in modern day filmmaking. You know, you go to watch a Marvel movie or whatever, and it is, they're taught, they are at the stage of doing about 2,000, 3,000 visual effects shots per movie, whether it's just, you know, erasing a wire out of a scene, right. to the scene being almost entirely computer generated. Um, so in terms of where I am as a filmmaker and, and, um, the integration of visual effects into my work, it, a lot of it comes down to planning. 
Uh, so in my first, um, my first short film, one of my mistakes was that I did not walk through enough, do enough pre-production work in my visual effects work. And visual effects is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't done a budget, a big budget in a while, but back when I did my last one, it was about 10,000, um, 10,000 US dollars per shot. (laughs) What? (laughs) Wait, um, and and where does the ex the main part of the expense it, lie? It's all it's all human time. Mm. Um, you're talking um, multiple passes. You have to do your first passes. You're talking your animation passes, your renders. Um, you'll have multiple artists working on one shot. You know, you'll have an artist. Desi- you have to have I'll models. Br- I'll break that down. Break down the passes. Yeah, so yeah. um, so let so kind of working it out. Kind of where you start is you have to visualize the shot, right? Mm-hmm. You as a director, you start with a storyboard. So, um, there's cost in storyboarding, um, previews as we call it, and then that has to go to an animator of some kind, and that animator will usually um or a visual effects plan that you'll usually block out the shot, whether it's usually just using mannequins or whatever in the 3D um, software. Um, just using an example, it varies from the type, depending on the type of shot. Um, then you've got your, you know, you have to have somebody building that environment that your things are in, whether you're replicating a real environment like the studio here, or, or you're doing a warehouse or wherever the action is taking place that has to be built. You have to have your characters. Um, these days, we use a lot of digital doubles. Um, sometimes we do a blend of a weird blend of actual footage just on a on a doll. Depending again, this all depends on the scene. Then the scene has to be lit. Um, sometimes you have animation that goes into the scene, motion capture. Um, you know, then you have your um, effects passes. You know, if there are explosions, mm-hmm. if there, um, for instance, a huge one that people don't think about is hair. <laughs> um, we were working on a on the pitch for a werewolf thing and budgeting it out, and we were like, how can we avoid, you know, having to do like a ton of like hair renders and simulation and stuff like that? Because every every layer of complexity you add to the shot that's another layer of cost, mm-hmm. you know? So you can imagine that, you know, you're doing an independent film and you have a budget of, you know, half a million dollars or a million dollars, you know, you don't have the money to be spending $10,000 for a shot. Right. You know? Um, but so um, the reality for me is the aim is so when I use it, it's to use it to its maximum effect or to, you know, Oh, I can see where you spend that money in a yeah. sense. Or it's so or the other aim is that it's so integrated into the story that it doesn't detract from what people are watching. That's the other kind of goal. If you're not going to go for spectacle, go for it being completely invisible and just adding to your story. I see. And yesterday, last night, uh, you had mentioned that you use Unreal Engine. Yeah, that is such a exciting place where we are in filmmaking. And can you explain what Unreal Engine <laughs> yeah. is to everybody? So Unreal Engine is a game engine. A lot of the most popular games in the world now. Um, th- at one point, the most popular game in the world, Fortnite, is built on Unreal Engine. And what it is, it is a kind of a layer of um, between the creator and computer hardware that allows us to just build things, build worlds for video game, um, apply programming, that kind of stuff. Uh, so what a lot of people have done is that we, they have basically adapted it. Um, Epic, the company that makes it, has embraced this side of it, adapted it to do live 3D, um, 3D generation. Um, so we can do environments, you can do characters all in real time. And what it's, it's allowed is this thing called virtual production. So we can actually do, we can actually, I can actually take a camera and attach a sensor to it and basically operate a camera like how I would in the real world. And we can also synchronize cameras so we can actually integrate live action footage into these virtual spaces. It's something that we see in a less complex way on the news. Um, a lot of news news for the weather, for the weather thing and sports um sports reports and stuff actually use it a lot to bring up those nice graphics you'll see them standing in the studio and then all of a sudden this column of information appears beside them um it's it's an evolution of all those technologies and um even even an old 
kind of old school technique, back project, rear projection. Um, they've all kind of evolved into this, um, this virtual production space. And it's, it's a tool that has allowed um, cost reduction in some ways, but also accessibility to things that would have needed a whole team or a ton of, um, you know, a ton of equipment. It's still expensive in, a, in absolute terms, but in terms of things, it's opened up a world of possibilities in terms of filmmaking. Oh, I've seen YouTubers use it and I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah. I mean, literally like we will just be like walking around here and then like we have like these exoskeleton suits on that people are looking at on the, yeah. on the, on the um, monitor and it's like perfect. Yeah, it, it's, it's very, it's very, very good. I mean, you know, there's still always work to do. Yeah. But the things that you can do and integrating it with tools um, like Blender, which is actually a 3D modeling mm -hmm. suite, um, is been, it, it gives people, um, filmmakers, the ability to do things and to showcase some storytelling that is beyond what we've ever been able to do. Um, at the, I know kind of at this independent low level, you know, before you'd have to have a team of people, but now with, um, Blender and Unreal are free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can go and you can learn and they embrace, they embrace people just taking the tools and doing things for free. And, you know, you can reach out, we can get models online. You can reach out and get, you know, designers from all over the world to collaborate with you in the space. Um. I, for instance, I'm a big proponent of utilizing the cloud for production. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge, um, a huge thing. And, you know, we can, you know, the possibilities are there. Um, I have a project that we were working on um, since 2018 that kind of stalled because of budget and it kind of exceeded our vision. Our vision exceeded the budget at the time. Um, and we... And um, we've been having talks about actually taking that production, that initial set of footage we shot, and integrating it into um, a project involving Unreal Engine and stuff like that. Because we wanted some, we want our vision has scale to it, but we don't have the capability to do what we want mm -hmm. with a ton of real actors and stuff. Because you know, real actors. Um, real actors and crew and stuff when you need for what we want to do it's weeks and weeks of shooting and you can imagine if you're spending excellent say, money a day real actors cost real yeah. money <laughs> so, but yeah. with the motion capture stuff mm -hmm. we can you know we can do things we can beg people time we can ask favors hey can you come in and just do this mocap you know in the afternoon after work that kind of stuff so, you know, it gives us flexibilities and lets us fit into, the, you know, lets us build this you know, sci-fi vision that we have, even though we don't have time to go build a ton of physical sets and that kind of thing. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And like when you, when you, I hear these things, like these things that we're discussing, like Blender is free, Unreal Engine is free. Uh, we talked about YouTube University. Like my mind automatically goes back to opportunity for young people and especially young men and young boys in in jamaica and i think just the creative industry in general it's just an outlet of opportunity for young people to gain a skill learn something and become incredibly valuable to themselves their family and to companies and production studios like your own that you can eventually bring on and have this pool of talent that can be pulled from and you know, you just don't, at least I don't, I don't see it on any sort of mass level or mass scale that we're, we're pushing young people in that direction. And, and if you feel the same way, my question is, what do you think that we can do to kind of open the eyes of young people to kind of go in this direction? And I'm thinking, you know, we're here in the grill, we're in country. And again, there's a lot of young people that have talent but don't necessarily, maybe not even, their mind isn't even open to something like as cool as it. Cause like everything you talk to me about, like, this is so cool. If I was a young person, I'd want to be in this. I want to, I'd want to learn, like, how do I do this stuff? And so my question again is like, you know, how do we open up the minds of young people and 
push them, maybe not necessarily push them, but at least like, hey, this is a real opportunity for you to become something bigger than yourself in an industry that I think is, is thriving and could be very, very lucrative for you as an individual. Yeah, no, you, you hit on it exactly. Um, and then going back to my journey, um, one of those things that I've been doing over the last um, about 10 years or so since I've been back home is I've been uh, teaching film and television production at the um, UWI Community Film Project. Um, it was started as a project um, focused in the Augustown area initially, and um, it's a short program, about three, four months, where we teach them skills in filmmaking and television. Um, and it expanded to multiple communities over Kingston and as far as, um, oops, <laughs> and as far as Montego Bay, um, the Montego Bay area, I should say. And um, in that program really gave me a, um, insights into kind of stepping out of my bubble. You know, I, one of those things that I, I have recognized since um, coming home is that I do have a serious level of privilege. You know, as much as I have my own struggles in this space, I, am, I do come from a level of privilege that a lot of people don't have here. And um, being able to work with the young people and to see um, to see the impact that just the learning of the skills has had on them. And not all of them are going to stay in the industry, um, but to see the impact that teaching them those skills has had on their lives. And, you know, they'll come to me and, you know, they're not doing film anymore, but learning to work with a team, learning to, you know, learning some of the business skills that we taught them and stuff like that. You know, even, you know, and sometimes even they might get a one job in film, but that leads into something else and that kind of thing. And it drove home kind of the importance of creating opportunity and the, the need for investment in the creative space and kind of pursuing that building of the industry at, a, at multiple levels is something that is has been a passion of mine i've been very involved in trying to lobby the government to um, invest in the creative sectors not just film um, because my heart is still you know part of my heart is still with theater and live performance and stuff like that um i have i have been uh one of the first directors on the jamaica film and television association and part of our mandate as the Film and Television Association is to represent and lobby the government to for investment in the industry. And recently, I'm sure you've heard that the government has pledged that they're going to do a billion dollar fund for the film and television industry. Amazing. Um, fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all, you know, words are nice, but action is better. Right. Film, that's that, you know, that's, that's film. That's what film is, you know. It, it's It's a... It's a medium of motion, a medium of action. <laughs> um, and not just um, at one level, right? We have to invest money in building the industry, actually producing high-level content that will get the high-level talent employed and working on a consistent basis in this country. And what's going to happen is if we do that, have that high level content create um have those high high level uh, performers in the industry the people with years of experience when we give them opportunity and the demand for them rises that's going to create demand further down this the um experience ladder mm -hmm. and create opportunities for these young people the people that are coming to the UA film project to train and um we're hoping to expand in the space with heart as well i've had talks with Hearts about um, developing training programs and certification programs in film and television. Um, it's a very involved process, I've learned. Um, it's not easy to, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about, but there's a lot of work that goes into structuring these things. And it is going to take time, but it requires, um, I think it is, we're at that stage where the ideas are there, we have a sound basis to start the process. And um, I think we, we ha we are now at the stage where it, it needs, rubber needs to hit the road. Um, one of the big um, projects that I've been involved in in the last um, year 
has been the drafting of um, the Cultural and Creative Economies Act for Jamaica. And um, the process, I'm going to be very frank, um, the process has stalled. Um, and it's not because of the stakeholders in the industry. We have reached out and we were all very willing to collaborate and get something done. But the problem with a lot of legislative work here is that it's at the whim of the minister and the ministry. And if there is no will there, then nothing gets done. <laughs> um, and so we are at a stage where we're deciding what like what are the next steps we are going to take as a as a collective uh so we are working on that um to give it to give the basis because that's kind of what legislation and policy and stuff should be it should be the basis on which we build things you know and we want to, to have that basis that consensus among us as as a as a whole side of things in jamaica because um, for too long, the creative sectors as a whole have been, have had our worth kind of um, other people taking credit for the value that we have made. You know, um, a lot of our, the earnings that we bring to Jamaica end up on the tourism mm. because a lot of, you know, when those big productions come down here, you know, a lot of that money is spent on hotels and transportation and stuff, and they're not counted towards film. And can you get, can you be like specific? Um, and and and, and the way I'm interpreted is yeah. like, you bring a show that's from the US, like a reality TV show yeah. that come down here, you do the logistics, everything like that. Right. That gets counted towards tourism instead of. Yeah, a lot of those film. logistical costs and stuff, they count towards tourism, but and not really towards fil the film and motion picture industry, even though we are the ones we are the ones that are supporting and and reason behind the ability to bring that, those earnings in so part of the process is to get ourselves properly accounted for there you go right and then to then take that now say this is our worth and then build on that build the ability to bring new players into the industry new talent um, support more of the arts and you know young filmmaking at the very grassroots level and then have that top end where you now we're making shows that are going to be on Netflix we're earning global in the global box office and global streaming and distribution markets and stuff like that so it is a it's a ecosystem it's a whole ecosystem of stuff that's gonna have to go in for us to as well once we have that going and you know we can we can we're seeing that stars are being made you know that's you know oh this is a jamaican movie the kids can what you know when the kids can go to palace or turn on tvg or go up on youtube and say wait a second this movie this is a jamaican movie <laughs> this is a jamaican this is so and so i'm really in this a real thing you know, and then they can see people that they've seen in their real life. You know, because Jamaica isn't a big place. You know, we, we be, you know, we're big in different ways, but we're not a physically large place. So you, you see a lot of these people that know on, you know, on a 16 foot tall screen, you know. Yeah. And that's where the inspiration is going to come from for them to say, you know what, I can go make money from this because they see it in music. You know, unfortunately, in music, a lot of it is... um is kind of the flash and the thing but sometimes you need a little bit of that to create the motivation to create the aspiration mm -hmm. for them to go and pursue this now these initiatives that you're talking about they're absolutely imperative not only to the industry but to the prosperity of the country and we when i think about like even what's happening in 2023 and i want to talk a little bit about this earlier when we're talking about the tech stuff is like is AI and there are a lot of things happening in AI that I think are going to not think that there's a lot of jobs that people are going to lose. Right. And I look at like the film industry that there's a lot of it that it cannot be done by a computer, no matter how you slice or you dice it. And the investment that you talk about making like with heart, crucial that like needs to happen and we have like young people that 
don't necessarily like they can't even see they, they don't even fathom like coming into this industry but if it's an official part of the government's arm to be trained in that way at least the basic level because i have this ambition that and i'm going to do it is pretty much doing something like you're doing where we have some sort of school whether it's official or not but we have young people come in and learn the basics of everything we talked about from gaffing to lighting to sound design, um, learning the equipment. And I wanna be able to fund it. And perhaps we can even make it, if it's not free, it's gonna be at a very, very low cost. And it, the, the whole thing is just like creating this immense pool of talented individuals within the industry. So like you said, people can move up. And like, that's the only way that it can happen. And if we don't have a pipeline of talent just coming in from literally nothing to all the way to the person who's like you said trying to be on netflix or whatever then it's the industry is just going to continue to struggle and struggle and struggle and i commend you on being part of this move in and, and and pushing the government to move in that direction but we need to more of that needs to happen like it's just so so important and again as this world is changing and a lot of jobs that we've invested in in jamaica like i think a lot of them are going to be gone and we have to think down the line what can we start doing now to put ourselves as a country in a much better position to give opportunity especially to young people and i think the film industry is one of those industries that we can do that no you're, you're spot on um uh things like you know uh where i see um you know i'm i'm always a blue sky person i'm usually a blue sky person when it comes to technology i i love um i i love kind of where the machine learning i hate the term ai <laughs> <laughs> because there's no there's no actual intelligence in what we have right now it's um I, 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 I always, I, I do want to do my Twitter threads. I always have to be like, I'm going to call it AI, but only because that's what everybody's <laughs> calling it. Um, but I, you know, I use machine learning stuff in a lot of the work I do, you know, just tracing stuff, you know, and, you know color selection, all that's machine learning. So it will always, you know, it, the technology will move forward. Um, but the problem I see is, and you, you hit on it, uh, we're going to lose a lot of jobs in a lot of sectors because um, the, the lang large language models and stuff, they're going to be able to, do it, to get to 80% very easily of what people can do in a lot of positions. Like customer service is a huge one. I, I, before I came up, I had to do something with Digicel and I didn't even talk to that person, <laughs> you know? It was like, okay, press this, you know, if you want to do this. And, you know, you're talking with a robot in my digital app. It's like, hey, I need to do this. You know, these are your options, blah, blah, blah. You and better believe it. It's, it's going to be it's gonna be the primary thing, you know, mm -hmm. before people, you know, before you even get to a layer of people. And the amount of people at those layers is going to get less and less and less, you know, as, as the AI gets better and better. Um, I got my first AI question in a development meeting I was having with a team from Canada the other day. Like, is there any way you think that AI can help us in this, <laughs> in this project? And I had to kind of deflect the thing. Um, but um, as it is, I think that the threat there's in, in the creative industries, especially out here, I don't think we have a threat of AI um, taking or things as you said um uh creativity is problem solving and right now the language models the machine learning and stuff like that they're not they can't solve problems they can't identify problems they can't solve problems you know as a writer that's what you're doing in your script you're creating problems and then solving those problems and you know maybe one day the machines will get to it um, but for now, um, they can't. They're they're a powerful tool, though. I think um, I kind of like the stuff I see from Mid Journey for like just doing some previews, roughing out some ideas. You know, sometimes even even I was using I was playing around with Bing on my lap, on my thing because I had like one of thirty grant applications that I'm filling in, and they all ask you for variations of the same thing. So you know, there are there are points at which it'll come in and be useful. Um, but I think that we need to be we need to be smart about what we do as a nation um, in terms of preparing our young people and recognizing that the skill sets they need are not 
the specialty skill sets. You know, they don't need to, you know, you, you learn to, do, you, you, you learn in a specific space. Um, let's say you learn accounting or something like that. It's not necessarily accounting skills that might be um, important, but are you able to manage a team? Are you able to, how effectively are you able to communicate with the client? How effectively can you follow up and solve this problem? Because that is one thing um, in training young people that I see as an issue is that they are so afraid to take on problems on their own. They will always defer to you as the, you know, as teacher or manager or whoever, because they don't feel empowered to do that. Mm -hmm. And they also don't have a lot of the basic skills needed to problem solve. They, they're, they're short of communication skills because our language skills are so, um, are so bad on, on a, on a macro scale. Our mathematics and logic skills are worse <laughs> and they need those. They need those basic things because, you know, when, when you're faced with a thing like they, they, they'll come to me, I tell them when, when I train them in these things, um, my expectation is not for them to succeed. But what I, I try to do is I always try to push them into tackling the problems and taking on the problems on their own. You know, before they come to me, there will always be problems that are above their heads that I need to step in and solve. But I want them to try and take on the problems that they face in production because that's what production is. Like I teach them, you, you go and you teach them the structure of producing a thing. And the big lesson is you go in with a plan because stuff's going to happen, <laughs> right? And if you go in with a plan, that means that you have a basis to work from and you can then focus on solving the problems. But if you go in with no plan, then, you know, you're going to be dealing with not having a plan and then the problems that are going to show up on the day of production. And the nice thing about school is that school should really be a place where you're not going to make the best movie you're not going to you know we're not expecting you to be a master filmmaker and these are words that have stuck with me um, from a lecturer at film school um big up my career is <laughs> <laughs> um mike introduced me to wawa and is probably responsible for about 10 or 15 pounds that i put on while i was at school <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah the um the he you know he came to me and he said you know when you did the first course we're not expecting you guys to master these skills at all. We're expecting you to screw up. We're expecting you to make all the mistakes. Why? Because you can make the mistakes here. Because when you get out into the world and you have a client or you're working for a director or whoever it is and you screw up with them, you could end your career there. You know, And I've experienced that in the real world. I've screwed up with a big client. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, I've screwed up with two big clients on two projects, and thank God I'm still here standing. Right. But when those things happen in the real world, that's car payment not getting made, rent not getting paid, you know. Consequences are real. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, it took me a while. That's relationships under stress, that kind of stuff. And, and you know, it's important to teach them to how to deal with failure as well. Mm -hmm. Because again, those things will happen regardless. You get out into the world and you will, something will happen and it's not your fault and well, and it's gonna come down on your head. And we do have a little bit of an accountability issue here in that when things go wrong, people's first reaction is to be defensive and to say, you know, to try and either pass off blame or not accept, you know, and not accept And I it. tell you. You know, and it's it's just those things are going to happen and you need mm -hmm. to learn to deal with it and face it head on. You know, so all those things, those are the things that they need to be learning. You know, if you're communicating properly, then the chances of somebody blaming something on you um, when it goes wrong is a lot less. <laughs> you yeah. know, if you're saying to your client, like, look, I don't think we can do so and so and so. And the client insists, then what you tell them happens then it's not on you the client might cuss you and blame you but at the end of the day you communicated right, everything right. clearly like i've had that issue and still had to deal with 
you know, somebody maligning me on a project, even though I was like, we should do this, you know? So, you know, we need to, we need to think, we need to think beyond the rote, the rote learning, the specific mm -hmm. things, you know, we, we, there's a lot of talk about steam and, you know, all that kind of thing, but we need to be focusing more basic on the you know the human to human aspects of these things that we then can build those specialized skill sets on build the scientists build the mathematicians build the engineers build the artists you know on because it don't you know we could teach them you could learn all the the, the multiplication tables all you want but if you can't you know sit down and have to talk to somebody and share your work that's the point. That's the point no, too. and that, that's like kind of like an underlying theme of, of what you've been talking about today, which is communication. Like it's just so under, so underestimated. Um, and, but it's paramount to everything. And then also you just said something also important, which is self accountability and taking personal accountability for your actions and your responsibilities. And like you said, I, I've also found that working here in this, in, in, in this industry, but then also just even with my hotel here, like the same thing, it just, the, the, the default is defense. The default is how can I put this on somebody else or blame somebody else for this? And self accountability and personal accountability for, 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 for your actions and for your responsibilities, it's so empowering. It's so empowering where you can say like, this is my fault, this is on me. Because when that happens, and, and you gotta, we understand it's like, you only grow from your failures. And that's the only way you can get to that next level by admitting that you, you're wrong, you failed, looking back, assessing it, and then growing and being better from there. But like, if you don't do that, you're always gonna be the same. You're all, if you don't look back and, and analyze yourself and say where I messed up and take it personal accountability for whatever it is, you're going to be the same because you haven't, you haven't marked it off and said, I could have done better here. I can adjust here. And the next time a situation like that comes around, you're going to make adjustments in your behavior. You're going to say, I'm never going to get caught like that again. But if you never have that conversation with yourself, man, forget about it. Yeah. It's, it's something that I pursue kind of subtly in my work as well. Um, part of the the inspiration in some of the aesthetic choices and the, cinemata the cinematographic choices that I made um, and the writing choices as well is that one of the questions I ask myself is, um, you know, am I the bad guy? Mm. You know, you talk to women all the time, you know, and you you hear the, the horror stories. I've had friends tell me some things that I can't share here. You know, these are people that I'm close to, girls that I've dated and girls, women that I've dated and stuff like that. And everybody has, all of them have a horror story with a man at the center. And part of my own personal journey was realizing that I had the capacity and that's some of the inspiration going back to nice lady for the Kanaimo is that I had me personally have the capacity for that evil. And I am probably, and not even probably definitely, um, have done things that have crossed lines in the past and stuff like that. And part of my journey and, and using my art to hold myself accountable and me, you know, and recognize those changes and hopefully in some way be able to pass on those lessons to somebody else, you know, that even if it's, you know, one young man that looks at that movie and goes, oh, damn, I get it now. You know, I can, em I can now empathize. I don't have to say, I'm one thing that pisses me off is when people say, you know, I'm the, you know, I have sisters or I have a mother or I have a daughter. It's like, no, you shouldn't need it to rely on any of those things you should be able to empathize with a woman and what she's going through just because she's there in front of you and um it continues kind of that theme also continues into my second piece with blackout it's really um it it has to do with the main character is a man and in throughout the whole story throughout the whole journey that he's going on in that story it's about him not being able to hold himself to account for some of the things that he's done and con and eventually confronting that at the end of the story. 
So, you know, it is, it's something that's very close to my heart because, you know, that personal accountability, I'm not perfect. Right. You know, I, I, I'm on that journey to, to using that personal accountability to better myself because I've had my struggles and struggles because I wasn't able to hold myself accountable at key points in my life. So, you know, um, it's something that I definitely hope to think and I've seen the impact of when, when the lesson has sunk into some of the young people that I've taught and who I still mentor to some extent and how they have transformed their lives and, you know, kind of how proud that I am to see them and the progress they've made because they have addressed, they've looked inside and addressed their shortcomings and grown from that. Man, like that is so powerful and profound. And you saying it is one thing, but then I can only imagine the journey that you've gone on to get to that point, to be able to articulate this and to turn that journey into a, a, a visual in real life experience for others to experience and learn from like that. And that's incredible. It's, it's, it's something I'm working on and it, it has, it has also saved relationships in my life. You know, there are, things where you're ready to blame other people, you know, it's your fault and stuff. And yeah, other persons have blamed to, to share in it, but really and truly is if it stood back and took stock of what I really should have done, when, when I should have, you know, I should have taken charge or I should have stepped up and said something at some point, like all of you realize that you, I needed to, I realized that I needed to do that first and, you know, it, it hurts, you know, it, it, it burns and you kind of want to curl up mm-hmm. <laughs> and not, and not want to deal with it. There, there, you know, there are nights where you actually, you know, get cried or just lay there and not want to move for days at a time. And, you know, it, it, you know, kind of, this is where the passion for the industry and stuff no, that... um, kind of comes in because it's the, you know, they say follow your passion, but really and truly you should do something um, you, know, you should earn some money first. <laughs> um, but when you're doing something like film or, or art in general, you know, or anything, anything you're passionate about, really, um, there's a pragmatic level, but there's that level where that passion is what's going to get you through, you know. And when I'm facing, you know, my internal struggles and stuff like that, you know, whether it's depression or, um, you know, the anxiety, anxiety is a huge one for me, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, this... You know, luckily, you know, I didn't have to drink rum to be here. Today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know, anxiety, you know, you go in even to this day, like every time I have to go and screen a movie, I, last time I screened the movie, I wanted to just fold up. There was a flaw <laughs> in the movie mm. and uh, something didn't export properly. And I just wanted to fold up because it reminded me of a previous screening where the movie just came out too dark for the projector and I'd. Again, I wanted to just fold up <laughs> and, you know, you're going to deal with these things and it's the passion that gets me out. It's kind of the living for um, that moment where you do get it right, you know, and it's not just, you know, it wasn't for me um, with Nice Lady and when I had the issue with the screen, I was facing that thing, you know, and the thing went wrong and then people came up to me and said, yo, I loved it. And I'm like, oh damn <laughs> like to myself i'm like oh damn um it, people really the, the the parts that i worked on really hard you know i did worked on really hard on everything but the parts that i really spent time to improve my craft at writing the story structure that kind of stuff and those connected with people more so than necessarily the sound design or you know the things where i was under a lot of pressure for time um and those those parts shone through, even though the other parts didn't quite meet my standard. That was like, you know, it it's worth it. You know, that that's where the passion is rewarded, and you know, thing. You know, maybe one day it will reward me with, with money and you know a little bit of things so I can buy a nice, but you know, buy a nice car. At least give my car an oil change or something. <laughs> but you know, um, it it's finding finding something like that to really drive you. You know gets you through those times where you have to confront yourself mm. and deal with the reality, you know, the, the, the not nice parts of life. Yeah. Now that is, 
growth, bro. Like that's, that's amazing. And the fact that you just have this presence of mind to put yourself through that. And I think a lot of people don't, especially I think a lot of men don't, and they just don't want to have these very real and sometimes very hard conversations with themselves. And again, you just stay the same and maybe even regress and just don't have that level of maturity. And I think like that's like that's that that's such an important part of life that I have myself have experienced. And I try to and I don't try to tell people how to live their life. And and I, I try to really speak from more from a standpoint of principle. And I think this is just one of the principles of life to be able to have this self-actualized growth is you have to go and be willing to be on this journey and like open your mind to it and have that presence of mind. And you may be thinking of like a young person out there or maybe any person in whatever stage of their life that they're in that they're not getting anywhere or they're not, whether it's they're trying to earn money or they want to find a partner or they want to develop these friendships that they don't have. And a lot of it, it comes down to like, can you hold yourself responsible, responsible for where you are in life and what you may or may not be achieving. And again, from a principle standpoint, it's just like having those conversations. And as you tell me that uh, the little that you told me about that journey that you've gone, gone on, I can only imagine what it was like. Yeah. Um, and I, to kind of connect it back to the art and talking shop a little bit. Um, one of the things that I do is I do um, script consultation. Um, the term is we, you, we were trained on was script editor, but I, I prefer to think of it as a script therapist. Mm, um, and I like so that. My role is to not just give the writer feedback and say, hey, you know, it's not like a newspaper editor where I'm going to the article and no, you can't say that. No, you can't say that. It's to talk to the artists, the writers, and to get them to understand you know, and hold themselves accountable for what's in their script, in a sense, and to get them to um, to understand what changes they need to make to get to their own vision. Because a lot of the times, you know, that lack of accountability stands in the way of you achieving what you want to do. I've had a project um, kind of fall through because the the writer did not want to they, they, you know, as a writer, you always want, as a creator, you always want to see your work as perfect. And I, <laughs> I wish I had more confidence like that. I wish I had some of that blind confidence. But um, so a lot of times I find it gets in the way because they see this work as this perfect, complete thing. And the truth is every work, there's no such thing as a finished script in this world, right? Um, there's a huge writer's strike on now and a lot of people are learning about how Hollywood works. Because the last writer's strike was before Twitter and social media was a thing. So a lot of people now are learning, oh, writer, there's still writers on set writing changes to a script right. while it's being shot. You know, and there are a lot of people finding that out for the first time. And, you know, because of that, that for the fact that you have no final script, you have to be open to change. An evolution of this idea that you hold so close, oh. yeah. <laughs> you hold so close to your heart, right? And you, they they say kill your babies, but it's really not <laughs> about killing your babies. Yeah. It is about understanding that this might be not be the right courage for that baby. Put, put that baby aside. That still your baby, but in the project it may come up in a different project. It may come up in a different form, and you have to be you know right willing to let go. And and part of accountability is being able to take that criticism and internalize it and weponize it to go. make your to make your work better, to sharpen your blade, if you will, so that you can go and craft this this thing of that's going to be beautiful at the end of the day. And a lot of it too, um, and sorry to keep going down this this path, but like it's it's also ego and being able to just control bring your ego down and have your mind open to that constructive criticism and like you don't know everything you know and everything you said like not perfect um but before we move forward 
please explain kill your babies to everybody <laughs> okay so um there's a saying that yeah. uh, when you're writing when you're doing any kind of writing really mm -hmm. um you have to be prepared to kill your babies these are you start writing a script and you have all these ideas in your head and it's the best ideas in the world it's the funniest joke it's the cool action sequence it's this line that you just got to get in there you know and you write the script and a script is a living thing like when i write a script like i will put a script down for three weeks and go back to it and say oh my god what did i write there mm -hmm. um you know but it's this living thing and then as you're writing it's just evolving and you just start vibing with characters and you know uh, you know things start happening and then all of a sudden when you go back and you you review it or somebody else reviews it you just find that this thing that you loved at the start just isn't working and you're just trying to force it into this thing that it just doesn't belong in and the advice and the, really the advice is about being able to just let that go yeah give giving up those things that you're you really want to hold on to for the betterment of the script as a whole yeah very important hard process to go through <laughs> it's a pain man. yeah 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 <laughs> it, it's painful it's painful i have written whole sequences 20 pages of thing and just reach the end and then read it through and then it's like oh my god this doesn't work this isn't true to the characters that i've built and then i just have to take it out yeah and i think i have when I, whenever i write i actually have like two or three documents open so that if something isn't working here, I'll just cut it and paste it into another document and just have it there that I can go and work on it on the side or, you know, ju I just have it there just in case something works out and I can bring it back, you know. And kind of wrapping up here, uh, I just want to get into some some fun things. Yeah, we went we went deep on the serious <laughs> stuff, which who knows where these conversations can go, to be honest. Uh, but do you have a favorite movie? My favorite movie. Oh, my God. Um, so have some different spheres of this right i my favorite kind of recent movie of things is dark knight i'm a huge chris oh Nolan fan gosh, yes i think that is i'm a huge action movie buff um i think that work is such a brilliant piece of work in the space of superheroes where your expectations or expectations at the time that came out is we we had you know we didn't ha really have high expectations for what a superhero movie could be at that point they were you know you'd enjoy you'd enjoy you know we had x-men and stuff like that and we'd enjoy it dark Knight, um not dark Knight, batman begins had come out and that was a pretty good movie mm -hmm. you know um but it has this moment in it and i use that moment now to judge kind of every movie um in a sense the truck flip when that the whole sequence with the chase and the truck i'm watching this and watching cinema with the especially action movies it's a jamaican audience is is a unique experience worldwide yes i um, agree i don't i, I yes. can't i've watched movies all over the world oh my god really yes, yes yes i can't really <laughs> say that you know there are many experiences that i've had that have matched it but that truck went up into the air and it was like the air left the and when a Jamaican audience gets silent in a movie, you know, says something, you know, it's not a boring, <laughs> like it got silent, like you could hear a pin drop. And then that truck just landed. And um, I think what had happened there, I think he went up on the wall and the bike did a flip and did punch oh, them, start <laughs> lick, and the place just tore up. <laughs> and I think like that became my gold standard for building a moment in a movie. Mm. And, you know, the whole movie, the, the everything, I realized going back and watching it again, that the whole movie, and this is halfway through the movie, this isn't even the end of the movie, the whole movie really, you know, how he built up to that and built that emotional, to that emotional beat, you know, and then, you know, he had Garden tearing off his mask and stuff, spoilers, spoilers, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Garden tearing off and revealing that he was alive and all that kind of thing. All of that just contributed to this big emotional moment and and I you know it became such a point of analysis and inflection because it was also around the point where I was really getting into the film and TV industry as well and understanding narrative structure and all of that that was kind of at that point in my journey and I really came to appreciate it more and more as I went on because 
I started, I loved the ending where it became such a human at the core. It's a big action movie, multi, you know, $100 million action movie. But at its core was this human story, you know, and when the prisoners throw the detonator overboard, you know, and, you know, you realize that it's emotion and heart at the core of that story. And so, you know, it's still, it's still like my top movie in this kind of new frame of mind of movies, but I have a guilty pleasure movie that I have watched multiple times every year since I was basically born Top Gun. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. I, I had the tape. I watched the tape until the tape could tape no more. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, Maverick came out last year and mm -hmm. I was in seventh heaven <laughs> <laughs> because I had my little, when I was small, I had my little jumpsuit. Oh, okay. I had two jumpsuits. So I had my Air Force one for Air for, um, for Top Gun. And then I had my helicopter one because I used to watch Airwolf as okay. well. So, you know, I'm, an 80, I'm a baby of the 80s. So I grew up on all those action movies. That's stuff. so dope. That's so dope. Um, but I have one Dark Knight is one of my top movies um and like you said there's just like so many different elements and storylines you talked about the prisoner's dilemma um you the, the truck scene as you were saying it like the sound of the truck in the air that the like that's what i'm hearing yes. like that's how impactful that that scene was and you're so right and i tell this to people all the time Go to a movie theater, like when a movie first comes out in Jamaica, it's unlike any other movie viewing experience there is in the world. I, I, I didn't know anybody else thought that. Yeah, no man, John, John Wick. Like, oh weeks my ago. gosh, yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah, and action movies specifically. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh, yes. It is, that is an experience by itself aside from the movie yeah it's just being in that movie it, theater it's, and it's something i miss desperately during covid oh, like yeah. it, it's such a social and then uh, my girlfriend she doesn't she's you know she's not a huge movie person ironically <laughs> but she you know she's like why do you want to go to the cinema i have to explain that like going to the cinema and i have i have a nice tv at home mm -hmm. i have a huge tv unnecessarily large tv because i get away with the excuse that i make movies i should watch them at home be able to watch them wherever in high quality and i'm gonna have to explain that even though i have all these things like going to cinema is a it's a social thing as much as it is about the movie you're going to watch you know audience is is a fa is such a fact in a movie and i think that i realize now that the you know the big companies and stuff are realizing this again that that experience is is not replicable with streaming or oh, anything not, like not that. even close <laughs> you know? not even close uh, the, kind of kind of getting off on a little bit of a tangent here one of my subscribers we did like an example of we were just using chat gpt live on my live stream uh and one of the examples we gave was uh they they were like uh tell it to write a letter to the nego chamber of commerce on the importance of having a movie theater from the perspective of from a community standpoint and and i never thought about this until she mentioned it and she were i know her i've worked with her actually on a project recently um that she came down for uh one of my team to document it and she was saying that a movie theater is so important to a community and how it builds community. And I haven't looked into it, but like I was just kind of thinking about it, like from an anecdotal standpoint. And I'm like, holy crap. And I just like going back to when I was a kid and when I was a teenager and me and my friends used to go to a movie theater and we used to hang out there. And it was just like big social events and we got together. And I remember we used to go to see like we were into like uh like our our cars and fast and furious like it was just such an event do you remember that like yeah everybody brought out their cars the underbody lights souped up like it was an event every time one of these movies came out and i was thinking i'm like man the grill needs a movie theater not just from yeah. a profitability standpoint but it, for the it's community a, it's a hub. and it's one thing that jamaica has lost as well because if you actually drive around a lot of the communities you'll actually see the remnants because a lot of the buildings are still in use of the original set of theaters across I the see. island um you'll still see this space where the screen could go and stuff like that and it's very unfortunate that we've lost that community level theater and it's something that I've had multiple discussions about to see how we could, what's the most 
effective way to bring that back. And yeah, we'll get there eventually, but there are, as with everything in this place, you know, commercial and political considerations mm-hmm. that are going to get in the way. But, you know, it is, I think, whether it's a traveling cinema or something like that, it's going to be important to, you know, push the value of the, the film industry locally, you know, to, so that people can see. People need to see themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and that's important. The value of um, one of my favorite local actresses, she is on one of my favorite TV shows. Um, Chantal Jackson mm-hmm. is on Death in Paradise now. And I can't. It's so hard to watch it. It's so scattershot where it's going to be showing and what time it's showing. Mm. And then... I'm rarely ever home at the time the show is on TV and, you know, to get it on streaming, it's so difficult out here. And we need to consider our access to the thing, you know, to our, to see our stars, to see our movies, to see our content. Because um, you'd ask me, um, you know, about which movies were local movies were on streaming. <laughs> I had to go and look and see which ones are still mm. streaming and where because we have no real local access um, for our content. I mean, there are efforts being made and I appreciate everything that Digicel Play has tried to do, that Flow has tried to do, that TVJ has tried to do. Um, But I think we need need to kind of centralize our efforts. We need to not look at everything as competing, but realize the value of realize that there is a point that we can't we can't be fighting for scraps we have to recognize that we're not a big space we're not like we don't have a huge audience but we need to invest in building those audiences yes. and it's going to take time and it's going to take money and it's going to be painful and you're going to you're going to have to pay artists for content mm-hmm. um big up the big up the writers guild of america for taking the first stand in 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 fighting back against a lot of what is going on but um yeah we need to we need to make that investment and i think so, i'm hoping that um in this discussion about billion dollar film fund is a is a discussion about investing some of that and private more private investment and stuff in distribution and exhibition platforms that are accessible and that we can really build our local audience and build a high because with our music, with everything, it all starts here. It's all, you know, as a filmmaker, I can't go out and go on a microphone in a, in a club or at a dance <laughs> or something right. and bust, bust a tune. You know, it, it's, not that e- you know, it's not that easy for us. So we need, we need a little more effort than others to do it. And, you know, I'm hoping that we can get there. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Who's your favorite director? Oh my god, <laughs> this is thing. I have grown. I have grown to love so many of them. Um, let me tell you. Um, I can say Chris Nolan. It's my <laughs> easy way out. Mm-hmm. He's he's one of my favorite working directors. Um, I also have a love. I'm a I'm a old school. I love Hitchcock. Um, okay kind of work it's informed so much of what i've done um writing wise and stuff and recently i've taken uh i've recently taken a a deep interest in um akira kurosawa's work um re-watching a lot of like run and um and names are leaving me right now but um his his body of work and um I have also been starting to look into a lot of um, Asian action directors as well. Um, I'm going to butcher names, so I'm not even going <laughs> to try. <laughs> but I have been, um, you know, they, they, they've they had a space over there where they've managed to grow a largely sustainable film industry. And I'm talking China, Malaysia, Thailand, um, and, and so on, and Korea, especially Korea. Mm-hmm. And they produce such a wide variety of work and take such chances and they're not working with the budgets of the U S and UK and stuff like that. And I've really started to, you know, start to break down their work and their business models and stuff like that to see, you know, learn kind of these South South things. You know, we always looked up the aim is always 
the talk whenever you talk about developing the industry is oh bringing hollywood to jamaica and the truth is we need to look more you know south south you mm-hmm. know um what what's working in nigeria what's working in asia and you know those kind of things and build and you know, build our industry <laughs> okay okay um and i guess the last two questions to wrap up where can people go to either find out more information or find out how they can support the Jamaican film industry? Oh, absolutely. I'm always going to push them. Um, JAFTAonline.org. Um, that's the Jamaica Film and Television Association. And they're JAFTA Online on every social media. Um, they're always posting stuff about screenings and, you know, um, workshops, ways, you know, and all these are ways to support it. Um, if you see them posting stuff to share it with your friends and your family, um, they have screenings coming up. I believe we're working with Kingston Creative um, for their end of month thing. So they're going to, the theme is film. So they'll be showing um, the products of their propeller film, um, their propeller film program. So that will be a, a very good um, event. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Okay, awesome. I believe it's May 28th. Or May, something like okay that. may 20 last last sunday in may last sunday in may okay yeah. uh hopefully this will be out before then <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Uh, but nonetheless uh good to get the info out and where can people find out about what you're doing and and what's going on in your world and yeah. how can they follow your journey oh absolutely so i'm very bad at my my professional um thing i tend to um I've been working on getting better at it, but I'm uh, my professional side is Watuka Films on everything. Um, WatukaFilms.com, Watuka Films Instagram, Watuka Films Twitter, um, even though we're trying to use Twitter less, but, um, and Watuka Films on Facebook as well. And we are also, I'm, we're supposed to be relaunching the website at some point very soon. Um, we're trying to you know, get, give a little bit more focus. Um, I believe the movie Nice Lady is still available to rent on the site. I have to double check. <laughs> okay. Um, but the, um, we are, but I'm also Bertitude on all the, um, on all the socials as well. But that tends to be, I do talk work stuff there sometimes. I, I, I try, I go on rants from time to time, but it's, it's a lot of terrible jokes. And, um, and advocacy for various things that I believe. In. Well, I mean, I, I can't thank you enough, man. No, this man, this is an, a pleasure. No, this <laughs> is an awesome, awesome conversation. And I appreciate you again taking the time out. No. And we will, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Yeah, no and problem. I know, I think I have a lot to learn from you. So maybe when I come out to Kingston next time, yeah, I can just be your shadow. Yeah, yeah man, just, just give me a pitch. Okay. <laughs> I will, I will, I will. Awesome. Appreciate it again. Thank you. <laughs> nice having you.